Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to our Bastogne Law video. Now, Bastogne is one of the dukedoms of Bretonia, located at the very heart of the Kingdom of Bretonia itself, and it has a long and illustrious history going back to the very founding of the Kingdom. Now, Bretonia, unlike the Empire, did not unite behind Sigma. In fact, it didn't feel nearly as threatened as the people that would one day go on to become the Empire, further to the east of their territories. Instead, they ended up living very sort of secluded tribal lives, particularly in their early history, when they'd become very famous for being horsemen tribes and would often war among one another. The natural protection that mountain ranges surrounding their little uh, area provided them, stayed off the threats from orcs and goblins and the undead and other things like that and really bought them a lot of time to build up what they discovered in their lands which were a number of old ruins. Now little were they to know at this time that these were elven ruins that had been abandoned during the War of the Beard where the elves and the dwarves had gone to war and the elves abandoned all their territory and left these cities to rot away. But these early primitive Bretonians found them built up cities around them, strengthened their walls, and as such, when a sort of significant threat of greenskins eventually made it across the mountain ranges of Bretonia, each city could pretty much defend itself and never really had the need to unify because Greenskins being greenskins, whenever they'd get to a building, there was no one to fight, everyone was just hiding behind the walls, they'd eventually just move off and get bored and go find something else to kill. So that worked for a very long time in Bretonia. So around the year 770 of the Imperial Calendar, so roughly around 2,300 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline, the tribes of Bretonia started to stabilize a little bit, warring became less frequent, and they started to establish 16 kind of set tribes that would go on to become recognizable dukedoms that we might see today. Now, over the run-up to the history of Bretonia, until they become one country, two of those tribes do drop out and get annihilated. However, the rest of them go on to be established dukedoms as we know them today, including Baston. Apart from the loss of these two tribes, peace kind of ruled out in Bretonia for a bit of time. It was relatively stable. The odd threat of beastmen or greenskins would pop up, but each city would be able to deal with it. It wasn't until some 160 years later that the real trouble started. Greenskins started amassing in numbers never before seen in the lands that would one day become Bretonia, and it was just too much for kingdoms to handle on their own, although they did try and tackle it this way. Now, this trouble is not happening over sort of one year or so like that. It's just a constant build-up of pressure on all these Bretonian tribes, and they all start to eventually succumb to the pressure. There's just too many greenskins. They can't get out. They can't harvest. They can't grow food. It's all getting a little bit tough. They have to ride out and meet them in battle, and they start to lose, and they start to lose badly everywhere all at once, and that invites other external pressures as well. The men from the north start to raid down south, they start to cause trouble in the lands, as well as beastmen herds popping up here and there. All in all, each one of these tribes is on the cusp. They're all about to lose out. Now, as far as Bastogne is concerned, the ruler of the people who would one day go on to found Bastogne had an idea of marrying off his daughter to the leader of the tribe that would one day go on to become known as Lyonnaise. So they get married, and it happened to be lucky for the king that this was a good match, as well as the fact that his son was best friends with this uh, ruler of Lyonnaise. So that kind of solidified a link between these two tribes or peoples. Now, the king's son himself is making a name for himself all over the lands, and he's renowned to be a warrior of some repute, and his son is Gilles. Now, Gilles goes on to cement this reputation in the year of the imperial calendar, 952, when he infamously slays the huge red dragon, Smirgus. 
and he went on to cut off the dragon's head, collected its skull as a trophy, and made a cloak out of its skin, which he wore all the time into battle, and provided huge amounts of protection for Gilles. The trouble is still building, Gilles is still the up-and-coming prince around the land, and in the year 975 of the Imperial Calendar, the orcs attack again in this time of trouble, and although the Kingdom of Bastogne manages to fight them off, they are, however, dealt a devastating loss, and their lord is slain. Now, that serves two purposes. It elevates Gilles to the position of leadership for the people of Bastogne, and it has made Bastogne probably the place with the most complete army left, because it seemed that this was some kind of synchronized attack in the recent Troubles, and many of the other tribal kingdoms or provinces, or whatever you want to call them at this stage, were really struggling and had actually perhaps lost, if not were in the process of losing their own fights against the Greenskins. So in this particular territory around Bastogne, Gilles rides out, and he knows this has to be a threat, but he knows there's no aid coming from anywhere. The Greenskins will be back in greater numbers. He's getting reports from all of his neighbors about the terrible trouble, and so he calls his best mate and brother-in-law and he says look if we're gonna do this we probably have to do this together it all seems hopeless baston still has a good army but everywhere else is about to fall and then after they've done that they're gonna come for us all is lost unless we maybe try this one last idea i have of riding out to meet the orc threat at least if we die, we die gallantly in battle, rather than waiting for the slow death and massacre of all our peoples. So him and his best friend, Sheriff of Lyonnaise, are uh, joined by a very sort of famous warrior knight known as Landuin, who is the at the time the ruler of the territory of Moussillon. And the three of them come together, amass their armies, the bedraggled remnants of Lyonnaise army, the Bastogne army, and the Moussillon army, and they're around this lake near the forest of Chalon. There's sort of slightly desperate, a lot of the men are bedraggled having been through a number of fights, and they know that tomorrow brings their final battle. Now, where exactly this encampment is, we're not 100% sure. It could be um, within the borders of Bordeloo, or it could be in Bastogne itself. The kind of exact location has been lost to time. Regardless, they're there, they're together, and they're trying to come up with a plan, and they begin to um, just try and think of something, when suddenly they're all struck by this vision. This absolute beauty emerges from the waters of the lake and promises them potential victory. Without going into the exact detail of what everyone said, uh, Gilles is the first one to come forward. He asks for the blessing of this wondrous creature. He sticks a banner in the water and it automatically comes out fully uh, done up as though it was a brand new banner. Um, it provides him strength. He can feel it swell within him. The lady has a grail with her which she fills with water and allows the leaders from each each of these provinces to drink, imbuing them with huge amounts of strength and power. And the next day they feel blessed. Each one of the knights and warriors would dip their sword in the water or a spear or whatever they would have and it would strengthen their piece of equipment. And renewed by this vision of beauty and hope, they march out to meet the orcs the next day and absolutely slaughter them. The three knights in question themselves, imbued with unimaginable strength and vitality, just tear down hundreds upon hundreds of orcs almost single-handedly. And the spark of hope is lit again amongst the lands that would become known as Britannia. Now, for those of you who have maybe followed some of my other Bretonnia videos, you know that this leader of Bastogne was Gilles Le Breton, the great unifier of Bretonnia. He would go on to have another 13 huge battles all around the lands of Bretonnia, bringing more and more people to his banner, fighting off the Greenskins, fighting off the Beastmen, fighting off the Norsken Raiders. And it was this point in history that the individual kingdoms of Britonia or tribal lands of Britonia decided, you know what, maybe it is better to group our strength for the oncoming threats this world has to pose for us. And they named Gilles Le Breton, the leader of Bastogne, as the first king of Britonia and establishing Britonia as a unified nation.
By the year 995 of the imperial calendar, Gilles is king, and he is said to be... There's kind of different laws being taken different approaches to this, but I'll kind of make an amalgam of both of the stories that I've seen around this. And he's heading back to Bastogne. He gives in to nostalgia a little bit one day, and apparently decides to go back and visit the lake where the lady first appeared to him. You know, just to relive the good old days when he was fighting every single day for his life and for his people. On the journey, he's said to be ambushed by a marauding group of orcs, and he starts to engage the orc warboss in combat, and the orc warboss is armed with a magical axe. Now, in some earlier lore, it said the orc warboss kills Gilles Le Breton with this axe, but in later lore, it's discussed that it wasn't while he was locked in this combat with this orc warboss, a cowardly, probably a gobbo or something, used a cowardly missile weapon and struck Gilles Le Breton, killing him. Whether that was a bow or a bolt thrower, I think it's a bolt thrower it's often spoken about. So that kills Gilles Le Breton and cements the idea of all missile weapons being cowardly and only fit to be used by peasants. So he is potentially killed in his home district of Bastogne, although potentially this did happen across in Baudelaire as well. But I like the idea of him dying on his home turf. And upon his death, it is said that Gilles Le Breton was raised up again by the Lady of the Lake to serve as her eternal champion, the Green Knight. Now, if you'd like more detail on Gilles Le Breton's campaign or his work as the Green Knight, do check out my Green Knight lore video popping up in the top right-hand corner now, or you'll find the link in the description below. The next kind of uh, great incident to involve Bastogne was probably the Crusades in the year 1449 of the Imperial Calendar, where Bastogne, along with all the other dukedoms of Britannia now, um, all sent troops to go and fight in Araby and to save Tilly to a certain extent so that was the largest event and that was then followed in 1813 by an outbreak of disease known as the red pox that wiped out huge amounts of the population of Britonia, and baston was not spared this atrocious curse then in the year of the imperial calendar 1932 a character known as the Red Duke, who'd been causing problems elsewhere in the Kingdom of Bretonia, had been defeated, or had in fact murdered his descendants, being a vampire lord that he did not know at the time, and was a little bit insane. But he fled from that battle, his forces losing it in the end, and it said he fled to the forests of Bastogne, the forest of Chalon, and he hides in those forests to this day. So the Red Duke, although a character in Total War Warhammer appearing to rule Moussillon, technically by the law is hiding out in the Chalon Forest, potentially in Bastogne as well. And then by the year 2500, which kind of brings us up to date in the Warhammer timeline, King Louin Lyoncourt is crowned to the throne of Bretonnia. And around the same time, if not a little bit before, we're not exactly sure of when this happens, but the new Duke of Bastogne arrives is Bohemond the Beast Slayer. So the two of them come to power in the same era, and that is the current state of Baston, who birthed the Unifier, the great champion of Bretonnia, Gilles Le Breton. Moving on, let's have a look at the land of Bastogne itself. Now, to the northeast, it's kind of surrounded by the river Gizmeri, and to the south, there is the river Gilou. Now, most of Bastogne is huge just swathes of arable land. It's slightly split in half. To the west, it's more arable. To the east, it's more pastoral land. And they do have, to the southern edge, the mountains of Massif or Cal, whereby huge amounts of green skins live. Now, I've mentioned this in uh, my top five campaign videos, but it's a shame that in the Mortal Empires or the Grand Campaign map, we never had Massif or Cal done up. It is done very nicely in the Wood Elf mini campaign if you ever want to have a look at it in the game but it's a huge orc stronghold and many many times do green skin raiding parties march out from this mountain range in the middle of Bretonnia and cause trouble to all of the surrounding dukedoms not just Bastogne. Now the other big sort of geographical thing within the dukedom of Bastogne is the forest of Chalon. 
Now, the forest of Chalon is a hugely dangerous, if not small, forest. It has huge amounts of beastmen, huge amounts of undead, and a lot of undead beastmen to boot. Not to mention the Red Duke hiding out somewhere in this forest as well. Just a hugely dangerous place to go, and no one would ever set up any kind of timbering there. It has been known that around the edges of the forest, some timber yards have been set up in the past, but they happen to have populations that go mysteriously missing after certain amounts of time. The most one has ever lasted is about a period of five years, and then there was just blood everywhere, no bodies left remaining. Just a hugely dangerous place to venture close to, let alone go into. Towards the southern edge of Bastogne as well, and leading out maybe to underneath the province, it seems to be kind of thick in sort of honeycomb structures. Maybe it's a li rich limestone deposits or something. But there is a lot of water, underwater rivers, caves, a lot of sort of craggy rock formations coming out of the forest and in and around the forest of Chalon as well. Many, many places for monstrosities to hide and set up camp in this forest with underground tunnel systems, uh, underground caves, caverns, huge rocky formations. It's just a very sort of dangerous, rocky, hidden, dark, dank, terrifying forest. And to the north of the forest is also a huge geographic feature simply known as the Black Chasm. Now the Black Chasm runs from east to west and towards its eastern side is when it's at its most shallow and towards the west where it comes closer to the forest of Chalon is where it's at its widest and deepest. Now as it enters the forest it's said to be some 200 yards across and seemingly bottomless. If you drop a rock you will not hear that rock hit the bottom at any point. Now, it's a hugely dangerous place to venture near, with some mysteriously cold fogs rising up, known to kill someone who just happens to enter into them of cold. But luckily, this fog never goes too far from the chasm itself. What is much more dangerous if you live further away are the monstrosities that sometimes crawl out of the chasm, and that is the chasm spawn. Huge frog-like creature said to be about 10 feet tall, taller than some peasants' homes, just eats and devours anything within sight. Just horrendous creatures, and they leap massive distances as well. Much feared throughout the kingdom, and often require some truly skilled knights to deal with these monstrosities whenever they emerge. Now, no one in Britannia knows what these creatures are, or like what their origin is, or why they come out and venture the lands on the surface. However, scholars have noted that due to the stable nature, they don't seem to be sort of sucked back into the warp at any time, that they are not creatures of chaos. But apart from that, no one's really sure. However, scholars around Bastogne and wider Britannia are very willing to pay any potential adventurers to venture into the Black Chasm to find out what these creatures are and where they hail from and more about the Black Chasm in general. Now, no one's quite sure where the eastern edge of the Black Chasm actually end because it runs into the forest and from there no one's ever been able to track it to the to its final conclusion it's just known that it goes into the forest and that's it now the fact is that people just don't get through the undergrowth without it being a horrendously dangerous forest um, no one can make the trek even if they are fighting off all the things that come at them as they try to track down where the black chasm actually ends within the limits of the forest now unbeknown to Bretonians but no to us perhaps as the keepers of the law it is actually an area known to be a skaven den one that's very ancient and it's probably been around since the great migration of the skaven when they all spread across the world from skaven blight itself now, the Black Chasm was initially carved out territory of the clan Pestilens, the clan that would eventually make their way across to the New World. Clan Pestilens eventually are said to have abandoned the Black Chasm and gone away to pursue their adventures across and give the lizard men some trouble. But upon their return to the Old World, Clan Pestilens have been trying to reclaim the Black Chasm with the aid of one of their subservient clans, known as Clan Flem, I believe it is now looking at them an outsider probably wouldn't be able to tell the two clans apart they're kind of very similar
Fleur, except that Clan Flem doesn't have any uh, plague monks of its own or plague priests. And so they're kind of reliant on Clan Pestilence for that. But really, they're just the whipping boys of Clan Pestilence and reinforce their ranks to a certain degree. Now, on the other side of this issue is the clan that went in to claim Black Chasm after Clan Pestilence moved on and went on their adventures in the New World. And that is Clan Eshen. Now, Clan Eshen teamed up with Clan Mulder, and they're both using this as their kind of own cities and are fighting an internal struggle, apparently, within the Black Chasm for the control of it. Let me know what you guys think these monstrous Chasm spawn are. I like the idea that maybe Clan Pestlands got their hands on some spawn slan and they experimented on by Mulder and Pestilence and these are the horrible things that emerge out of the darkness that is the Black Chasm after decades if not centuries living down there without being able to see the slan go mad and jump out. But that's just my headcanon. Make up your own stories guys but I like it something along those lines. It's very fun to think about. But that is the Black Chasm, a very horrific piece of geography in Bastogne itself and somewhere to be very wary of. Now, on the other side of the Black Chasm, towards the mountain range as well, it's said that there are some mountain villages up there in Bastogne, but they live slightly isolated. They're said to be ruled over by a chap known as Baron Lothar, the Reddy, and they are kind of a autonomous cities up there, and not even cities, they're not that big. Autonomous human settlements who, one has to imagine, are made of hardy folk fighting off all the monstrosities around them and them sort of being on the edge of the forest as well. But that's about it as far as the geography of Bastogne is concerned. Now let's look at some more specific places. And let's start with the area here to the west known as the Humble Chapel. Now the Humble Chapel is said to be over a thousand years old. So that puts its founding at around the year 1500 of the Imperial Calendar. It's said to be the oldest Grail Chapel established and maintained by peasants. The story being that upon this site, a peasant one day was said to have seen the Lady of the Lake herself, and she praised him for being a good peasant and always following his master's orders, doing what he's told, and living a life of servitude. And as a reward for being such a faithful servant, he can graze the base of the grail itself. Now, not drink from it and become a grail knight or any craziness like that, but just with his fingertips graze the base. And that is the holy event that sent up the humble chapel to be built on the site. Now, all nobles tend to scoff at the suggestion that the Lady of the Lake would ever appear to a peasant. And so they have never believed the story, but allow the peasants their frivolity. And it's said that any sort of grail chapel controlled by peasants, if you give donations there or the peasants give a little bit of their money, it all goes towards this, the humble chapel. Now, it's perhaps a slightly ironic name in that the humble chapel is anything but. It's said to be a huge construction, lavishly furnished with elaborate stained glass windows, ornate furnishings made of gold and stuff like that. It's just a hugely rich chapel and quite the sight to behold as well. But that is the story of the humble chapel. Now, between the area of the Humble Chapel and the western border of Bastogne, around this sort of area, is also a city or town known as Garamond. Now, Garamond is uh, something we'll touch on a little bit later. It's where a very famous knight in Bastogne known as uh, Calaud came from. So we will get back to him a little bit later. Uh, but just remember, it's around this area, kind of near the Humble Chapel, at least we think. To the northeast, there is also the town of Sudé. Now, Sudé is the only town built upon the, or the only town of any significant sign built on the rivers of Bastogne, and it's thought that one would have to surmise, this isn't really written about anywhere that I could find, but one would have to surmise is a central trading area so that they can move all their food goods and stuff out of Bastogne, trade them along the riversides, maybe get them as far as a civilized Musiov not to be shipped out, if not at least to uh, some of their other neighbors 
to be sold and bought. So that's Sude over there towards the northeastern part of the dukedom. And last but by no means least, we have Castle Bastogne, built on a rocky outcropping that gives it a huge amount of height so it can overlook all of the sort of arable and farming lands as well as the forest of Chalon. And it's a fantastic defendable position and it can see something coming for miles and miles around. Now, being the home city of the founder of Bretonnia, Gilles Le Breton, there's a lot of holy sites around Castle Bastogne that many people like to visit. Stuff like Gilles Le Breton's personal chapel, the head of Smyrgus the dragon is said to be adorned on the eastern gate to this day, the dragon that Gilles Le Breton famously slew. There's also an area known as the Tower of Water, which is thought to be the actual residence, the tower in the castle that Gilles Le Breton actually lived in for most of his life growing up. And that is a truly holy site, and peasants and foreigners who dare to even look at the Tower of Water are savagely beaten. Now, peasants and foreigners aren't really allowed in a lot of these sites, but they are allowed to look at them, just not the holiest of the holy, the Tower of Water. Now, of late, there have been some dark goings on in the city. On the eastern gate where the head of Smyrgus is said, some people have claimed that the head whispers to them, and as such, there's been a bit of an uptick in crime around Castle Baston, as well as the fact there have been whispers of dark goings on and dark rituals taking place within the Tower of Water. All of these rumors are very heavily suppressed when anyone in authority would ever hear about them, but there does seem to be some iffy things going on around Castle Bastogne in the modern day and age. But all in all, it's a site of huge pilgrimage. There's also thought to be a cathedral of the Lady of the Lake here, and uh, many people just tend to visit it, as many cities have. It has sort of taverns and stuff. And there are sort of a very established tourism trade going on here as well, with peasants being shown around a little bit in massive groups, and nobles getting more one-on-one -on -one treatment for tours and the like. But that is Castle Bastogne. As far as the people of Bastogne are concerned, they have a firm belief that Bastogne is the heart of Bretonnia. Not just geographically, but as far as the moral center of Bretonnia is concerned as well. They feel that they hold the traits of Bretonnia truer than any other dukedom, those of courage and honor and pride, perhaps even taking it too far. Now, others perhaps see them as more sort of pompous than anything else, but they are thought to be a pretty charismatic people overall. Now, the fact that all knights seek out to become Grail Knights, this holds more true in Bastogne than anywhere else. They have an unusually high number of Grail Knights that come from this dukedom, more than any other dukedom, in fact. And this is just thought to be the fact that they stick so stringently to the ideals of chivalry within the dukedom of Bastogne itself. Due to this sort of purity of idealism, it's thought that Bastogne is not as corrupt as some other dukedoms are, but this has a sort of different side to it as well the fact that because none of the nobles are really concerned with things like running bureaucracies or you know effectively running whatever they're put in charge of they just tend to leave it to bureaucrats without much oversight at all and if they were to catch any corruption they'd surely punish or kill or replace anyone they caught doing the corruption but they very rarely hear about it because they're just so non-fast about dealing with the bureaucracy of whatever their personal city or town or whatever they're put in charge of so there is some corruption that creeps in but not from the nobles it's just more from the admin guys below uh, because the nobles aren't paying close enough attention to the let's say non-significant things of slaying monsters and going out and riding out into battle so that tends to uh, be much to the detriment and suffering of the people of Bastogne. As far as their relationships with their neighbors, they're said to have a very good relationship with Bordelou. However, there is some tension with Gisaru to the north. And this is mainly thought to be because Gisaru, having mainly mountainous and forested areas, doesn't have a lot of arable land and farming land. And so look enviously on their southern neighbor, perhaps looking to expand into that province. Now, adds to some of the tensions between these two dukedoms. Just to give you a bit of a taste of, you know, some of the quirks of the people of Bastogne, here are a couple of their sayings. 
One of their more famous sayings is, I'll do it once I get back from the black chasm, meaning I'm never going to get around to doing that, don't ask me. The term he's listening to dragons is a reference to someone being absolutely nuts, and there is always the famous one, oh, he's a grand admiral of the Bastogne Navy, uh, which is mainly just meaning he has empty titles, as you can see, because Bastogne is a fully landlocked dukedom, so would have no need, obviously, for a grand admiral. But I like that idea that, oh, he must be a grand admiral of the navy, just being he has empty and vacuous titles. So uh, that's the people of Bastogne. Now, moving on, let's talk about some of the specific heroes of Bastogne, shall we? Now, we mentioned him a little bit earlier, but let's kick this off with a look at Calaud de Garamond. And uh, Calaud is a famous character in Bastogne, not perhaps in the army books or in the rules of the tabletop game, but he was the titular character of a whole series of novels. So if you're a fan of Bretonni and you haven't picked up his novels, do pick them up. They're named after, I think, mostly his climbing up the chains of the ranks of knight so the first book i think is him as a knight errant and you really just follow his life as it goes around and it's a night it's a life of misery there's betrayals from within his family there's mutants from within the family there's a whole bunch of horrific stuff going on in this poor chap's life but he continues to rampage on, holding the vows of chivalry true, and looking to eventually become a Grail Knight, which he does eventually do, uh, spoilers, but you knew where that was going. And it's just following his life and times, and giving you a good glimpse into Bretonnia, its culture, and its people. So a fun little book series there, uh, go and pick it up if you're a huge Bretonnia fan, and want to know a bit more about them. It really sort of opens up a lot of windows there. But he also rises to the title of the Castellan the Baston. Now, I think that puts him high up in the military leadership of the entire dukedom, so really kind of a significant character in the dukedom itself. Now, Calard himself, although I don't know, I don't believe he was ever given any tabletop rules, although he might have been given them in a white dwarf I've missed or something like that, but he did have some magical items about him. And he had the Sword of Garamond, his uh, sort of ancestral sword, said to have been blessed by a kiss from the lady herself, and it kind of said to have sort of blazed with fey light um, as it sort of cut through armor as though it was butter. The other thing he had was uh, Elif Anar, the Dawn Spirit, which was an elven lance he uses when he's charging. And that is said to be made of a hilt that looks like a snarling dragon. And it too blazes with mystical fire. And he has his trusted warhorse, Galibor, who's said to be, you know, a very wise and strong warhorse. The offspring of his earlier warhorse, which he had when he was naught but a knight errant. Um, so, yeah, you know, keeping it in the family as far as his horses are concerned. But fearless and feisty nonetheless for his warhorse there. So that is Calard de Garamond. And uh, we will now move on to perhaps a more tabletop known lord. And that is Jasper Le Beau. Now, Jasper, as the name might suggest, is a remarkably handsome uh, questing knight who is going around trying to be elevated to the status of Grail Knight. And his most famous deed to date is slaying the great dragon Malgrimus, which is said to have been the greatest dragon of its age. Now, we don't know how that compares to, like, elven dragons and stuff like that, but, you know, it's a story about a dragon slayer. There's probably some exaggeration there. Now, when he killed this dragon, he's said to have rescued the daughter of the king, Isabel. Now, although Luan Leonker couldn't live long being a Grail Knight, the issue is whether that's Luan's daughter or Luan's sister, whether Jasper Le Beau rescued the previous king's daughter or this king's daughter. I think, as far as I'm concerned, I believe it's the previous king's daughter. I don't think Luan Leonker has any official children, so I'm going to guess it's Luan's sister that was rescued by Jasper Le Beau before he rose to the throne himself. And when he killed this famous dragon, Malgrimis, he's said to have taken its claws as a trophy that he still wears around his neck to this day. As a mount, he has his uh, wonderful Pegasus, which is ideal for slaying dragons in the sky. But on the whole, Jasper Le Beau is handsome. He goes around slaying dragons and rescuing maidens that's kind of his whole shtick uh, that's kind of what he's known for not much else written on, on him apart from that 
Now, in terms of his items, he has a helmet known as the Helm of Dragon Slayer, said to have been through so many battles with dragons that it's blackened by fire. And it's also, you know, picked up a trait because it carries the good wishes of the Lady of the Lake, and it will protect him from any breath fire weapons of dragons. Now, you could translate this if he's ever introduced into Total War Warhammer, which I don't think he will be at this stage. But you never know, further on down the line, we're still getting DLC for Rome 2, so maybe in like four or five years we might get Jasper Le Bull making an appearance, but you could translate that as he's immune to breath weapons from dragons. Now on the tabletop it's very specifically dragons, so Hydra breath weapons and stuff like that can still get to him, but I reckon you could ignore that and make him immune to breath weapon damage from anything really. That'd be a cool little trait for Jasper Le Bull. As far as his other item, he also wears the claws of that dragon he slew around his neck, and that said to protect him from lower beasts. They see the dragons and they're like, oh whoa, look at what he killed, he's gonna kill me, I'm gonna get out of here. And the idea is that rather than running away, it actually causes other monsters to lose attacks. So they might become harmless depending on how you roll, but it just would reduce the amount of attacks they have coming in on Jasper Lebeau because they're so intimidated by the claws he wears around his neck. Now, he's also said to be the owner of something known as the Virtuous Lance. Now, when Jasper Lebeau is about to set off on his quest to become a Grail Knight, becoming a questing knight, he's said to have taken this lance from the Grail Chapel of Sancerre, and it's a very ideally suited lance for him because it's entirely made out of metal as opposed to other lances which are made out of wood. Now, it maybe would make it less, more heavy and sort of less manageable, but for him it seems to work and it's ideal having a metal lance for dragon slaying. Now, because he's such a handsome devil and damsel saver, it's said that over the years this lance has collected quite the few uh, ladies' favors. So, sort of the neckerchief at a tournament style thing, I have to imagine that is, rather than their undies or anything like that. But you know what? He could be using it as the uh, sort of notch in the bedpost type of thing. But that Jasper Le Bou, his steel lance festooned with ladies' favors as he charges into battle against dragons. Now, as far as tabletop rules, what this lance did was that it would give him a more damaging charge, essentially, and also a chance to insta-kill something with the damaging charge as well. So, really kind of a handy weapon if you're going up against big monsters. The fact that you can almost instantly kill a monster with multiple wounds on the tabletop uh, would be a pretty good advantage for you there as Jasper Le Bou. But that's about it for Jasper. We kind of know his deal, and let's move on to to Bohemond Beastslayer, the Duke of Bastogne. Now, in many ways, Bohemond is the living embodiment of his dukedom. He's full of pride, devotion to chivalry, devotion to Bretonia, and all the ideals therein. This can take him to some negative places. His pride can sometimes overtake his sense in the fact that he will never actively gauge in combat with something or someone that he doesn't deem worthy. Instead, if he thinks you're rubbish, he'll just knock you out or stun you and then just walk away into the distance allowing perhaps a peasant to stab you in the belly with a spear or something like that rather than be deigned to have to face someone so incompetent himself so that's kind of his whole attitude and although he is said to be noble and have sort of true aspects of leadership, he does lack the element that we mentioned in many of the nobles of Bastogne, and it's probably a sort of top-down issue here, in that he has no care for the running of the dukedom itself. He generally couldn't care. He leaves the whole running of the dukedom to his steward, uh, as far as like admin tasks are concerned, and his justicar, as far as any kind of dealing of justice is concerned, and he tends to try and stay out of it. In fact, he would have been perfectly happy living his entire life as a hermit knight. It was only under the encouragement of Luan Leoncur, who asked him to take control of the dukedom, that he agreed to be the duke at all. Which is interesting, considering that as the Duke of Bastogne, he actually has direct heritage from Guy Le Breton. He's a great, 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 great grandson, or whatever have you. Now, Luan Leoncur, I don't believe, actually has direct heritage 
Black heritage from Gilles Le Breton, which some could argue would give Bohemond a good claim to the throne. However, Bohemond doesn't want that kind of responsibility and is more than loyal to King Luan Leoncoeur. He follows him, he thinks Luan's a great king and would die for the king gladly. So no conflict there, maybe just something worth bearing in mind. Now, his martial skill and combat ability are unquestionable. He has become a Grail Knight, and in fact, he was a Grail Knight before he became the Duke of Bastogne, and he became a Grail Knight pretty young as well. Now, being in Bastogne, and with all the dangers I've sort of mentioned to you, he's never short of a good fight, uh, whether it be around him or elsewhere. So there's always be beastmen or orcs or something to batter in, and uh, he's always happy to oblige anyone who would challenge uh, his authority or his martial prowess. Now, he's said to have been so uh, sort of looking so much on the hunt for a good challenge that he, during an event that has been since removed from the law, known as the Storm of Chaos, went out and was one of the only Bretonian dukes to actually go out and help the Empire fight off Chaos. But because that's never happened, it's not that relevant, but gives you an idea of what Games Workshop think his personality is like. Now, as I mentioned, he was fairly young for a Grail Knight, and he ended his Grail quest where he too, much like following the tradition, of Bastogne slew a mighty dragon and upon sort of chopping off its head the lady appeared to him and as tradition would dictate he had to duel with the green knight to be found worthy he was found worthy given the grail to drink out of became a grail knight and the lady asked him to wash off the dragon blood from his shield in the water she appeared out of and that blessed his shield as well making it a magical item now of his trophies for the dragon unlike uh, Jasper Le Beau, who who took the claws and Gilles Le Breton who took the head and made a whole cloak out of the skin he decided to take a thigh bone and carved it into the shaft for a massive mace he would take on as his weapon and that's what he uses to ride into battle with to this day now, he is a hugely prideful ruler, um, not great at the actual effort of ruling itself, but a great warrior, and I think would have made a much more interesting character as a legendary lord than Albrecht de Bordeleau. Number one being that at least uh, Bohemond had rules on the tabletop and was a character, unlike Albrecht, who never had a model or rules on the tabletop, at least as far as I'm aware. So, Beaumont B. Slayer, I think, would have been a great uh, legendary lord instead of Ulbrich. Uh, but there we go. And we may see him in the future. It would be great to see Beaumont B. Slayer make an appearance at some point for Bretonia in the future. Perhaps even putting him in the new world if you wanted to, uh, because he does like to go and seek out a challenge. Now, as far as his items are concerned, we have mentioned a couple of them, but let's just go over it. He does ride a warhorse. He doesn't ride a pegasus or a hippogriff or anything like that. Um, he has his mace, which we mentioned was made out of the thigh bone of the dragon he slew, and it has a head made of meteoric iron put together for him by dwarven runesmiths, so it has become quite a potent magical weapon. Now what this meant on the tabletop was it added a value of 2 to his strength and would allow him to do d3 wounds, so 1 to 3 wounds instead of just 1 wound, making it a fairly potent weapon on the tabletop. Now, his shield, which the lady asked him to clean in the waters from which she appeared, gained the ability on the tabletop to break magical weapons of other characters. Now, I've seen this a couple of times in some of the Legendary Lord videos I've done previously. Um, it would be a hard rule to implement in Total War Warhammer, so we might just see it be magical resistance or something along those lines, uh, rather than something that destroys magical weapons held by the other player. And that's about it for both. Bohemond Beast Slayer, Duke of Bastogne, and our Bastogne video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. It's one of the more interesting dukedoms in Bretonia. Farly fun. The mysteries of the Black Chasm, a particular note, at least for me. Um, hope you guys all enjoyed it. And as always, guys, thank you all for watching, and I'll hope to catch you all on the next one. Alright, guys. Bye.